Good afternoon. Welcome to the Wilson Center. I'm Jane Harmon, uh, the president and CEO, and delighted that um, Aaron Miller, the director of our Middle East program, is going to moderate a discussion with my brother, Ephraim Sneh. So what you have to know is, in 1992, I was running for Congress for the first time, and I made a trip to Israel, not my first trip to Israel, but a trip to Israel uh, to meet with a, uh, a bunch of folks, and it was suggested to me that I meet this military guy named Sneh. And we had lunch in, I forget, but he looked pretty amazing in this uniform, and he was a big deal. I think you probably know his background as a commander of the medical team in Entebbe and commander of the South uh, Lebanon Security Force and head of the civil administration in the West Bank and so forth. Uh, this is before I met him. But at any rate, we sat in Yaffa at a restaurant talking about the fact that we were both running for Congress for the first time. I was running for ours. He was running for his. And what would it be like if we got elected? And would we get elected? Guess what? We got elected. And uh, my career, I think most of you know about, his career was pretty damn fabulous. Uh, he was a member of the Knesset from 1992 to 2008. He was a minister of health during that time, deputy minister of defense twice, minister of transportation, and chairman of the Knesset subcommittee on defense planning and policy. And lots of times I hung out with him on my visits to Israel, and lots of times he hung out with me on his visits uh, to the United States. And he also ran, I think you all know this, uh, to lead his country. We were just talking about that. Would it have been different? Hmm. And uh, he has remained a dear friend. Uh, and when I was in Israel hmm, a few years back with my children and grandchildren, of course, we went to see Ephraim. And so what did we talk about today, for those of you of a certain age in this audience? Grandchildren. And I have seven and a half, uh, one more due in, in, in December. He has six, and Aaron is up to one and a half. I am. Yeah, it's taking him longer. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a blessing, and it's probably the best thing that we can think about in life. But uh, if you want wisdom about Israel and the region, this is the guy you talk to. And uh, lucky you, you're going to hear from him right now because Aaron Miller, uh, as I understand it, is going to conduct a conversation or is Ephraim going to give a... Ephraim will start with some... Ephraim is going to share wisdom first and then there will be a conversation which will include uh, questions from you. So uh, welcome to my brother, Ephraim Sneh. Thank you very much. Jane, thanks so much. And I, I, I'd only echo what Jane said, Ephraim, that you, you know, you've been a friend of the Wilson Center for a very long time and a friend of co and colleague of mine. And um, I, I've always known Ephraim to be someone who prides himself in being clear and honest about his analysis. And I think we would both agree that it's important for both the U.S. government and the state of Israel to bring clarity and honesty to both in terms of the analysis and what to do about the difficult situations um, that we face. Uh, I think Ephraim agrees with me that in order to fix the world, or at least to have any chance of fixing it, you have to first try to understand it. And uh, that's not easy sometimes. Um, Ephraim's going to talk, I hope, about the security challenges facing the state of Israel, pursuit of Israeli-Palestinian peace, what to do about Gaza, <coughs> the challenge of Iran, uh, and the two asymmetrical conflicts that Israel faces with Hezbollah uh, and Hamas. I'd, I'd only point out something I think that you know well, as someone who cares about the U.S.-Israeli relationship, that as much as the U.S. and Israel have in common, um, it would be illogical to assume that Israeli and American interests can coincide across the board. There are structural reasons for this. The U.S. sits in a very different place, than Israel does. And I think uh, it's an editorial comment on my part, but I would, I would hope that we, I won't speak for you or your government, that we understand the difference between a special relationship with Israel, which is extremely important for furthering American national interests, on one hand, and an exclusive relationship with the Israelis on the other, 
which pose challenges and problems, I would argue, for both, for both of our countries. So um, if Ryan's going to start off, we have until 2.30, I believe. If Ryan, you can take a fair amount of time, uh, I hope, to talk about the major security challenges that Israel faces and what um, you think might be done about them. Thank you, Aaron. I, I will speak about two security challenges that are very immediate, and you may see it in television, part of it, and to feel that something is going to happen. And the first thing is Gaza. One comment before that. Gaza cannot be separated from the entire Palestinian question. It's a manifestation. It is the imminent military confrontation that we may have, but it's a part of a, of a broader uh, problem. I think that the explosion in Gaza is unavoidable, and I will try to explain why. In Gaza, you have two million Palestinians with almost no water, not potable water, four hours of electricity per day, N no, almost no economic growth, under a brutal, oppressive regime of Hamas. This is a boiling pot. There is a limit to how much people can suffer. Now, Hamas tries to, f to direct, to funnel the explosion to the direction of Israel. But actually, the bitterness of the people are against Hamas. Hamas took over in Gaza in 2007, more than 11 years ago. They didn't bring investors to Gaza. They didn't bring businesses to Gaza. Even not even from the Arab world. Not even from the countries that support them, like Turkey and Qatar. And they turned Gaza to a launching pad of rockets to Israel. Because Hamas is an organization which is committed to ideology to the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood and the ideology of Mukawama. <coughs> Mukawama means resistance. No compromise, no diplomacy, as long as it doesn't serve the, 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 the goal of Mukawama, and wiping out Israel. Under this banner of Mukawama, no one can really govern Gaza for the long run. They succeed for 11 years. And one of the reasons is, and maybe you will be surprised to hear it for me, the regime of Hamas survives at the mercy of the Israeli government. There was no serious military attempt to destroy the military wing of Hamas in Gaza. Why? Because there is a contradictory tension between Hamas and Abbas, between the secular, moderate part of the Palestinian national movement and the religious, uncompromising part represented by Hamas. And the government of Israel, the governments of Israel, especially those under Mr. Netanyahu, want that Abbas will be weaker, even if the price is that Hamas will get stronger. This is the situation right now. The attempts to reach what they called arrangement comes from a, from a very short period of time where three, three interests converge. 
our government doesn't want that we are going to election somewhere in 2019 want to reach the day of election without rockets falling on our towns and villages Hamas needs to reduce the level of suffering of the, the population because they are afraid that maybe it will be the explosion will be directed to them and not to us and Egypt because of its security problems in Sinai, they prefer now that to keep Hamas at bay. That they will not be too active militarily, not against us, and that alone, not supporting the, the Islamist terrorists in, uh, in Sinai. So now there is an effort to make an arrangement, and though it's based on convergence of interest of three, three players, it, is, it will be very difficult to, to, make, to make it happen. Mainly because Abbas is against it and because the Israeli defense establishment knows that a period of ceasefire, no matter how you call it, will serve the Hamas to rearm improve its armament and educate another generation of children that Israel must be wiped out. So if this ideas of arrangement will f of ceasefire or hudna in Arabic will fail, we can expect that the provocations in the border that Hamas is now uh, trying to create will deteriorate to something which will be uncontrollable. And then what will happen? Another confrontation in the size and the character of August 2014. Airstrike, clashes in the border area, a blow to a blow to the to the Hamas, but not a fatal blow, not a change of the regime in Gaza, and that's it. And then we start again, as it happened. 2009 there was operation, 2012 there was one. In 2014, maybe will be another one in this year or in 2019, and then we should wait to another to another round. This is about Gaza. We have to be very realistic. So I'm often asked, what is this? What is the solution? There is the point is to those who understand Gaza, there is no solution which is only military, only diplomatic, only economic. It must be combination of political solution, military solution by disarming Hamas an economic situation by trying to rebuild the economy of this place where today we have two million hungry and thirsty people with more and more epidemics and uh, men in the of ch ch children, cholera that can happen, and so forth. So the accumulation of human suffering may explode to a military confrontation somewhere in the in the in the in the next year maybe sooner than that now about the, the second challenge which is iran and syria iran pursue regional hegemony and this is for them a mid a, a middle of the way objective on the way to global Hegemony. You may laugh, but this is what they have in mind. And if you want, you can read what they write. And if, if you take it seriously, they have the ambition to represent the entire Muslim population which in the world, which is 1.3 billion people. And everything is an is a interim a goal on the way to achieve it. Israel is only one target. It's not the only target. Now, as Khamenei wrote in his book, 
the way to get rid of Israel is by encircling Israel with launching pads of missiles that one day will launch rockets in Israel as they did, for instance, in 2006. And then the Israeli society, under the pressure of rockets and missiles, will, will implode. In Lebanon, they have such a base, approximately 140,000 rockets and missiles. In Gaza, actually, they succeeded to build a, a, launch, a launching pad with maybe 7,000 rockets but they are very close to Israeli towns. Only last week they hit a, a home in Beersheba. Fortunately, the, the brave mother took the kids to the shelter and they survived because the, the, the building was totally destroyed. And their intention is one day to turn the West Bank to, a, to such a base, and very soon they're already doing it in... Syria, their entrenchments, the, their the winners of the war in Syria, one of them is Iran. And the fruits of the victory is to enable them to entrench militarily in Syria, mainly by their proxy militias, Hezbollah plus two other militias, and to turn Syria to the production zone of sophisticated a um, uh, weapon, mainly rockets and missiles, with ability to hit precisely targets in Israel. What they are trying to do, their current effort, is to take st stupid rockets, to install on it homing device or navigation device, which are very accurate in the level of uh, GPS with deviation of few meters, and to turn the stupid rockets to a smart, precisely guided uh, ammunition. And by doing so, they will be able to hit in Israel, not in a statistic, what we call a statistical fire, which accidentally may hit important target, yes or no, but to aim it to, to such targets that the damage and the loss of human life will be as maximally impossible. That's what they are trying to do. Why am I saying that this, that the next um, war or armed conflict in Syria is unavoidable? Because there is no responsible government in Jerusalem which may allow this process to happen. In the, in the past history, whenever we didn't respond that such a process happens, like, for instance, in Lebanon, we pay the price. This is one thing. On the other hand, Iran and mainly the hardliners in the regime, the, Suleimani, the uh, General Soleimani and the leaders of the Revolutionary Guards, they would not resist the temptation to use their new military buildup in Syria and to use it against Israel. And it may happen that we, Israel, will strike some of the, tr of the targets of imp uh, improvement of weapons, shipment of modern uh, military uh, hardware, and they will respond in a way that we shall have to retaliate, and maybe this cycle of hostilities will not be controllable in a way that it will deteriorate to a full-scale conflict. But one thing I can say um, with some degree of, co of confidence or hope, that the government in Jerusalem will not tolerate the process that Syria becomes a forward basis of Iran against Israel. No one can take this responsibility by allowing it to, ha to, to happen.
and maybe it will refer to one point that we made about the Israel-US relations. At the end of the day, we are staying in this confrontation alone. It's we and the Iranians, period. Maybe it's uh, enough pessimism for the beginning. Well, no, I, I, well, I think you should, if you can, and I know you want to, talk about uh, the other piece of the Palestinian issue. That is to say, how to, in your view, maybe you can share a, an analysis as to why we don't have a serious negotiation ongoing and why the chances of a serious negotiation that leading to a final status agreement are long odds. And in your view, is there a way to change that? And then we can engage in some dialogue. I was reminded to squelch my phone. We spoke about security challenge. But, the, but the, the unresolved conflict with the Palestinians is an existential threat to Israel no less than the Iranian threat. With the Iranian threat, with all the unavoidable cost, we know how to cope. But the fact that we are marching towards being a national state for me and for many Israelis like me, this is the end of the Zionist dream. Today, we are about 50%, we when I say the Jews, the Jews are 50% of the population between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. What will be in 10 years from now? If the idea of two states Palestinian state on 22% of the territory and a Jewish state on 78% of this, of, of this territory. If it will not be, be materialized, it means that there is one state when the, the, the power is in the, in the hands of Israel and it will create a population with citizens of three grades, three levels. The top level, the settlers. They are the lords of the land. They are with privileges that are above the, is the other Jewish citizens of Israel. Below them, the Jewish citizens of Israel. Below them, grade B or C, are the Arabs. In one state while the, the, the Jewish population is in a minority. Whenever minority controls the majority, the result is horrible. And look at the world. Syria, as an example. Sunnis and Shia. Uh, uh, Alawites and, uh, and Sunnis. And if we are going to, a sit to, to this situation where we have three grades of citizenship and, the, and Israel is not democratic and not Jewish, this is the end of the Zionist dream. Nothing is worse for us than that. This is existential threat. This is a state that the majority of the Israelis don't want to raise their children in this kind of, of, of state. Now, the, the, the question is, can we reach an agreement, an arrangement of two states? It means partition of the territory. The price for us is that about 100,000 of settlers will have to be relocated with all the implications that it has. But this is the only way to solve the problem. This is the price. There are benefits from agreement, economic benefits, 
that by far above this price. The relations that we will have with the Arab countries, especially with the wealthy Arab countries, will give the Israeli economy unmeasurable horizon of development, really. So there is a price for the solution, but there is a reward. But to implement it, it requires strong political will that till now, since Isaac Rabin, did not exist. Prime Minister Ehud Olmert, in his very last uh, month in, uh, in power, succeeded to negotiate with Abbas and to reach with him, I would say, 90-95% of an agreement. But they were very close at the end of it. And then he had to leave office. Finally, he was indicted. He, he, he went to jail for $20,000 to have the right proportions, yes? But at the moment that he left the chair of Israeli prime minister, the agreement that he reached evaporated. And the challenge is actually to return to this point. But for this, you need a different government in Israel. And it's not enough. With a political will to change once for all the situation of Israel and the future of the Jewish state. Now, we have election in, two, in 2019. Nobody knows the, the results. The, we spoke about grandchildren, so if you see how the kids are playing with the puzzle and all the particles are on the carpet, the particle of the puzzle of the next Israeli government are on the carpet. Nobody, nobody knows how it will be uh, arranged in, in, in the end of the process. Who will join to whom? Which parties eventually will run for this election? What will do the center of the political stage? With whom will they uh, uh, align? But a different government in Israel and a government with a will to, to secure the Jewish and the democratic character of the state. Is it enough? No. Like in Tango, you, know, you needed two sides. In the Palestinian side, will it be Abbas or the leadership that would replace him? They should be committed to the legacy of Abbas, which means, and he always was in favor of it, to achieve agreement with Israel th through negotiation and not through violence. He always opposed the violence. He was against the Second Intifada. Till today he says that we shall never go back to the path of, of violence. And uh, so far he has no achievements and he's considered now as a failure by many Palestinians. Said, you told us that this is the way to, uh, to reach our state. Fail. But I believe that, th that even his successors, they have, an, actually, they have no other choice but to continue this, this legacy. And I will, with your permission, I will, I will say two figures which are important. The GDP per capita of Israel is 40,000. 42. But 42, I was corrected yesterday. $42,000. The GDP in the Palestinian territories is around 1,600. This is the ratio. Let's say one to 25. One to 25. The Arab countries around Israel and Palestine have 2,005, 3,000. But the Palestinians are not able, will not be able 
to build a modern society as they want to, but only through economic cooperation with Israel. Cooperation. If there is no peace, there is no cooperation. So their national dream is conditioned in peace with Israel. Because the majority of the Palestinians don't want to be another Somali and not another Iran. They envy the way that the standards of living and the style of living that we the Israelis enjoy. I give an example. In the Eid al Adha, I think, the, 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 Muslim, the Muslim feast uh, two years ago, the Israeli authorities allowed the Palestinians from the West Bank to enter freely to Israel. Half a million crossed the border, spent time in Israel, returned, not a single case of violence. Because they want to live as we do in a modern, vibrant society. And, it, and if somebody wants to see what is the opposite, let it go to Gaza. Gaza is under the Mukawama. Look at the results. So I started with some pessimistic comments, but basically. Right. <coughs> okay, so let's, let's um, you, di you identified three issues, Gaza, Iran and Syria, and then the pursuit of Israeli-Palestinian peace. Let's start with the, the last one, okay? Now, I share your, your sense that we cannot lose hope. There's no question about that. And is a two-state sto solution possible? Yes, it's possible. Let's just identify one issue which you raised. You're talking about a post-Netanyahu, post-Abbas situation where a leader or a collegial, collective leadership, and on the Palestinian side, that's much more likely. There may be four or five candidates together who would agree when a boss passes from the scene to emerge to maintain some coherence in Palestinian policy. I mean, we only really have one example of a transition from Arafat to Abbas, and yeah. it happened relatively smoothly. Excellent. And on the Israeli side, you are likely talking about a prime minister who can form a government that would be dedicated and committed to this proposition. It's not just the prime minister. It's the capacity to create a sustainable coalition, right? Okay, so I guess my question is this. If you look backward, and my own kids are tired of hearing this from me because I, to some degree, I'm persuaded that <coughs> You know, the Mandelas and de Klercks, the Sadats and the Begins, the Rabins, even the Perezes and the Arafats, in, at least in his first incarnation, are not so easy, Ephraim, to re that's my problem, to, re to recreate. They're just, they're not. And in order to tackle this existential um, challenge that you identify, you need leaders who are masters of their constituencies, leaders with pragmatism, leaders with vision, leaders who have the will and the skill to risk. Now, I, I would ask you on the Israeli side first, where will these leaders come from? Unfortunately, you don't see the, the, the quality of people in Israeli politics is not, is not as high as the quality of the Israeli elite in business and in military and in academic life. We have to admit it. You might make the same argument here, but yeah. go ahead. <laughs> we have something in common. Right. <laughs> but I believe that there are enough responsible people in, in the government that will be elected that are serious enough and responsible enough to understand that they don't have other choice. That if they leave things like that, 
they will be blamed by history. No, no one will forgive them. No one will forgive them if they will miss the opportunity. And there are enough people who, as a track to, will encourage the two parties to start serious discussion. And as I told you, I believe that the agreements or the understandings that Olmert reached with Abbas is reasonable basis to start. We don't start from this, uh, from this distance of positions. We start from this uh, distance of uh, this gap. The gap was narrowed by years of attempts. In many of them, I personally took, took part. But gradually, we explored, the, the, we explored the boundaries of the compromise. What is achievable and what not? I, I today, if you ask me, I know what we can achieve at the table. And it's, we are not far from it. So even if there are no Mandela's anymore and no the clerks, and, you, and we can't reproduce them, but I believe that the sense of responsibility of people who, who gained election, won election, will be stronger than anything else. I know all of them. I know all of them. I think that if you ask me what is the, the glimmer of hope in this new possible collective, the sense of responsibility. You're, you're arguing that the key motivator is this notion of responsibility and vision on the Israeli side, that the prospects of, a, of losing a democratic Jewish state will motivate. And while I, I think that's um, a very important consideration, and again, I look back not to become a prisoner of history, because I don't think history repeats. I think whatever Mark Twain meant by the notion that history rhymes, it's a much better point of departure. There, it's the rhythmic patterns of the past that are worth paying attention to. And if you look at those rhythmic patterns when it comes to peacemaking on your side, it's a history of transformed hawks. It's not a history of leaders who felt a moral or ethical responsibility. It's a history of leaders who did things when in fact they realized that there were either opportunities to do things, Menachem Begin, for example, or in the case of Rabin, who understood there was no military solution to the Palestinian issue, but that was prompted by an insurgency. Rabin came to this conclusion after watching what happened during the First Intifada. Begin came to this conclusion as a consequence of the 1973 war. So when you talk about what might motivate an Israeli and Palestinian leader or an Arab leader, it's insurgency in war, it's pain, usually, accompanied by the prospects of gain. That's been why breakthroughs in the, and there haven't been many, three or four breakthroughs in 50 years of the Arab-Israeli conflict. It's less social responsibility. On your side, it's transformed hawks, hard men who came to conclusions, including Sharon, oh. with the disengagement, all right? Mm -hmm. And Netanyahu remains to this day the only Likud prime minister ever to withdraw from any West Bank territory in the wake of the Y River Agreement, 1.6%. So even Netanyahu recognized during a brief period of time. So, I mean, I guess that's, that's my question. You need pragmatic hawks who have respect, who have the respect of the population and who are likely to respond not to moral or ethical responsibilities, but to the fact that they may have no alternative. The alternative is the status quo. And the status quo leads us to more and more pain. Pain right. and irreversible, and we are inching towards the the irreversible point. And everybody knows it. Now, 
maybe it was not your intention, but there may be another possibility that it will take another catastrophe to bring leaders to the conclusion right. we, we, uh, we must do something. I hope it will not happen, but I'm not sure that it will not happen. Yeah. Not, m not many people realize how combustible is the situation, not only in Gaza. One, we spoke previously about accidental war. Right. One event which will be tragic, tragic enough in the West Bank can inflame also the West Bank. <laughs> it will be very difficult to contain. Very difficult. We remain the massacre in Hebron by Baruch Goldstein. Then the Prime Minister was Yitzhak Rabin, and he succeeded to, to contain the event. Event like this may, br may ignite a huge flame. So I hope that only the historical sense of responsibility will prevail and will bring leaders that are not Sharon and not Rabin to the need to do something. <coughs> but it's hope. It's the intractable optimism. Right. Well, there's precedent. I mean, South Africa. Yes, no one ever would have believed, however dysfunctional South Africa remains as a state today, that apartheid would come to an end the way it did. And while external pressures may have been important, it never would have happened without Mandela and de Klerk. And that situation is infinitely, you might argue, more complicated and potentially violent than the one that, that besets Israel and the Palestinians. Okay, so let's shift to Iran. You're a pragmatic, you have a very pragmatic view of the Israeli-Palestinian issue, and yet I've always known that you are very tough and hawkish when it comes to Iran. You, you made the, or put on the table the notion that Iran aspires to regional hegemony, or even more galactic, that Iran aspires to global hegemony. I mean, I've watched the rhetoric and action on Iran over the last several years, and this notion, and I don't, I don't dispute the fact that Iran is a serial human rights abuser, it's an authoritarian regime. Um, there are real politics in Iran, however, but the notion that Iran represents this threat to the fulcrum of Western civilization in the way, uh, and your own prime minister has evoked images of the Holocaust and of Hitler's Germany. Does that really describe, in your mind, the threat and the challenge that Iran faces? Because if it does, if that's the disease, then the cure seems to me to be out of, out of reach. I mean, I would have argued that a pragmatic American policy would be to cooperate with the Iranians when it was in our interests and to contain and confront them when it wasn't. And that there's a great danger of slipping into the notion that Iran not only seeks regional hegemony but could somehow achieve it. I just don't think that, that the last 20 plus years demonstrates that with uh, and what you know, people's aspirations are one thing. People's capacities and capabilities um, are another. So, am, do I have this right that it's it? This is an active agenda that the regime seeks first to dominate the Middle East, even though a Shia will never be a majority, and Iran's primary problem is encirclement. I see them much more as an opportunistic power seeking to knock on doors and when they're, as Churchill said, and, and when they're open to move in. And I don't, I'm not saying they, they're not ideological, but it's a, it's, isn't it a dangerous conceit 
to think in these terms? This is how the prime minister thinks. Leave the prime minister alone. Let's speak about the reality. <laughs> Iran, or the regime in Iran, is a pragmatic regime with ideological long-term objectives. And they are so smart that they know to sacrifice mid-term assets in order to get closer to the final destination. This is why they are so smart. Generally, you, you see, ideology, people who are motivated by ideology are stiff and dogmatic and uh, limited. Not these guys. Look, they, they s you say about Shiites and Sunnis, they support massively Sunni organizations as long as long as they serve the purpose. They supported Sunni militias in Iraq and in Afghanistan as long as they agreed to kill American soldiers. They forgot about the schism between Shia and Sunni. Forgot it. Hamas. Hamas is a Sunni religious organization which means that they totally def they, they defy the legitimacy of the Shia, but they generously support them. And, uh, and uh, Nasrallah scolds the Hamas leaders and say, you guys should thank publicly Iran for what they are doing for you. So it's true, they are very pragmatic, very smart, and they, and they, they know to sacrifice. The GCPA, uh, POA, they like it? No, but they understand that they give away postponement of the nuclear project in order to gain money and international legitimacy. And they gained both of them. This was the trade-off for them. This is their pragmatism. But what we, why I am, I am so hawkish about Iran? Because I identify that very profoundly they are committed to Muslim uh, ideology, which is the predominant part of their behavior beyond what is practically needed to do tomorrow morning. And they want that their kind of regime will prevail all over the Middle East. And we have it. I speak, I speak about myself, ourselves. In Gaza, they have it. In Lebanon, they have it. Well, wait, but wait, let's. You have to look at each of these. Yeah, they oh, have influence. Yeah, no, in, I, I will, I will bring it to in, to, to, fi to in five capitals. The question is, yes, exactly. What kind of influence? How determinative is it? And whether it accords with this notion. And again, I'm not arguing. I don't want to write a brief for the, uh, for the malocracy in Iran. That's not my point. My point is not to succumb, because it, what you're suggesting, if Iran presents that kind of global cosmic threat, and you believe that to be the case analytically, well, then the cure, the antidote, the solution, has to be consummate and consistent with the nature of the threat. And what I see everywhere, if in fact Iran is this threat to the fulcrum of Western civilization, is either neither your government nor mine willing and able to adopt a risk-ready policy, a truly risk-ready policy of confrontation. I don't see that at all. I don't see that with your prime minister. And despite the rhetoric and the pressure and sanctions on the Iranians from the Trump administration. You read Mike Pompeo's speech, he makes it very clear. This president does not want a war with Tehran. Absolutely not. I'm stunned by the fact that in a year and a half, with one possible exception, there has been no kinetic confrontation between, not even in the Gulf with fast boats, let alone in Syria, between this administration and Iranian regular forces, Revolutionary Guards. There have been a few with Shia militias. But 
how do you reconcile? If, if Iran is such a problem, why is nobody doing anything about it, including Israel? There is one player that we didn't speak about. Russia? No. The Iranian people. The Iranian people is intelligent, smart, and eager for democracy, secularism, and enlightenment. Who cares about him? Several times in the last 10 years, they started to revolt and was brutally uh, repressed. And the real agent of change is not Israel, not the United States, is the Iranian people. What they want, if they, f if they achieve what they want, we shouldn't be afraid of anything because they want a secular democracy with economic development. Now, there is no intelligent plan, not intelligent effort, neither in Washington nor in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, to do it. I'll ask you a question. How many hours the Israeli broadcasting service Speak to the, to the Iranian people. One hour. That's all. A smart government used to, to, to build a special program to the, to the Iranian people in Farsi. But it's only tool in the effort. The real goal or the real change will be achieved through regime change in Iran by the Iranian people, not by B-52s that will fly from Guam uh, to, to bomb somebody in Isfahan. It's a sensible approach. No, that's what I think. I agree. Not by military force. And to tell you something, not that I'm, I'm not against the sanctions, but I don't believe that the sanctions will lead to regime change. What the Iranian people lack, and he doesn't see it, is positive incentive that it, it is worthwhile to risk confrontation with the besiege and the police and all these brutal forces in order to have a different future for their children. And what they see, unfortunately, from the West is that they are courting the mullahs time and again, time and again. Who sent them a positive signal? Nobody. That's why I'm saying I'm in favor of this intelligent approach. Mm -hmm. But I don't see who is intelligent enough and smart enough to translate it to a, a working policy. Makes sense. That's, that's what I feel. Okay. It's shortly after two. Let's... Go to questions. Do we have a microphone, Farah? Let's see. Hard for me to see. Yeah, second row here, third row. Wait for the uh, wait for the mic. Could you please identify yourself? Okay. Thank you. Jihan uh, Al from Al Hayan newspaper. Um, General Sini, uh, you didn't uh, uh, talk about uh, the siege of Gaza the major reason of suffering the people in Gaza, the two million, which is, um, uh, may cause the explosion. Uh, uh, you know, uh, for therefore Hamas put condition to lifting the siege uh, in return of uh, calm down and uh, quiet. The siege of Gaza. The, the term siege by itself is falsification. There is no siege on Gaza. We and the Egyptians do not allow to enter products that may serve a military effort of either building tunnels or producing missiles. And uh, this is our oblig obligation towards our citizens. We can o in other products, as long as the population in Gaza has the material ability to, to, to procure 750 trucks every day. When I was 
when I was a deputy minister of defense and in charge of Gaza, when we reached the number of 150 trucks, Secretary Rice praised me, thanks to WikiLeaks, I know it. But, <laughs> but now, b b b before the recent crisis, 750 trucks every day entered Gaza with all kinds of, uh, of, of products. This is not a siege. The limitation is about dual use uh, products that may serve, we, we can export, uh, allow import of, of cement and find it tomorrow in a tunnel under, uh, under a kibbutz in our territory. That's what we don't want that to do. But the whole context of siege, they turn it to a military camp. A military camp has limitations. And the situation of the population was so badly deteriorated that they don't have that they don't have money to buy. That's why the number of the of the of the trucks entering Gaza was so 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 much reduced. That's all. There is no th this is not siege. But the majority of people in Gaza they are, are not uh, uh, belong to Hamas. Uh, there is no education. Right. Right. There is no hope for the youth people. Uh, you know, education. They are not free to travel. Uh, go out and to see their family. Uh. Look, they are under, they are not Hamas, they are under very oppressive re regime and they suffer. And I, ha I will tell you something. I am in favor of taking humanitarian measures disregarding to all the politics to improve the water, the sewage, the electricity. And you, you have to know, there was a, two months ago, there was a cabinet meeting in Jerusalem, and our defense uh, establishment, MOD, Ministry of Defense, IDF, they came with practical offers, suggestions on the table, what to do to mitigate the suffering of the two million people in Gaza. It's not the Mother Teresa brought it, and not kind of uh, relief organizations. No, it's the Israeli defense establishment submitted to the cabinet proposals what to do for water, for medicines, for uh, these very elementary things. They did not approve it. They said one day, they didn't decide. Now, maybe there are some, uh, some readiness to to take these measures that our officers, our generals propose w without any linkage to the political situation, just to r reduce the suffering of the people. But the siege, the siege is invention of Hamas. Ephraim, I know you're against a long-term agreement with Hamas. I, I mean, I, mean I, I know how hard one would be to achieve, but if if the reality is that there will be no PLO unity, no unification of gun, one gun, one authority, one negotiating position for the foreseeable future, that seems highly unlikely. If there is no military solution by which you can destroy Hamas as an organization, and if the prospects of Abbas's return and the reunification of Gaza with the West Bank is remote, the real question is this, this situation could go on for five years. And, and I wonder why. I mean, I know it's in the prime minister's interest to conclude a long-term agreement, for, I would argue, for many reasons. But what, what is wrong? You argue that it's re Hamas will rearm. But if you could get a five-year, even longer, interim agreement with Hamas that would not just provide humanitarian aid, but would open up Gaza to development, what's, what's, the, what's the problem? I'm not arguing that this is the right solution, but what is the counter argument to that? As I said quite uh, explicitly, I'm in favor of long-term solution with the Palestinian people. I got it. In the Palestinian people, you have two forces. One which is 
at the end of the day in favor of coexistence with Israel and minority which is in favor of eradicating Israel. With whom should I strike a deal? With which of the two forces I should strike a deal? With the one who wants to negotiate well, with me or with the one who wants to destroy me? Right, but now, what happens? What happens? Yeah. The paradox is that everybody now invites Abbas to return to Gaza, but to allow the Hamas to have the real power. The one who holds the Kalashnikov, he is the one who rules Gaza. So he, uh, Arafat is invited to be in charge of the cholera, ab in charge of the sewage that spills over, uh, about the schools that your generous uh, president uh, cut the, the budget to. Right. To all this, Abbas will be responsible. But whenever it will come to who is crossing in Rafah, this Hanie or uh, Sinwar, excuse me, Sinwar will decide. He doesn't want to. He, he don't, he, if, if what he's asked to do will happen, the first, the first terrorist that will reach Rafah crossing from this side or another, and we, our intelligence will tell them, we demand that you will arrest him and you will not uh, let him enter. At the moment that the guy is arrested in, 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 in the crossing, by the, by the soldiers of Abu Mazen, 200 armed thugs of Hamas will come, boom, 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 shooting in the air, and will, and will release him, and Abbas will look humiliated by his people. Why should obey it? I will ask more than that. Why Israeli officials are pressing him to, to accept it? He says what we have to demand disarm the Hamas as a condition to any normalization. Right. He says it, and we blame him. What is the reason? What is the, the logic here? He says what we have to do to demand. So I don't, I don't believe in the ability of, uh, in the ability of Hamas to become a mellow cat. I'm not arguing for that. So why should <laughs> I? Uh, meanwhile, me meanwhile, people. Suffer. I'm not. I'm not gambling on the on the on the security of Israel. Well, clearly, those who have been negotiating over the course of the last 18 months to conclude such an agreement on your side believe that it has some merit. The Complicated, I grant you. Okay, next. Yes, over here. Thank you very much. Benjamin Tour, no current affiliation. Uh, given that Iran's military and defense uh, expenditures are a small fraction of the military and defense expenditures uh, and equipment of its Arab neighbors and Israel, uh, couldn't, uh, it, doesn't it make sense that what Iran is doing in the region is a form of forward defense. And it's enhanced or it's increased uh, efforts to develop missiles, including more accurate missiles, as you mentioned, is a way to deter against potential strikes against Iran. I don't think that the strategy of uh, Iran is a defensive one. Uh, what they use their, 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 their money is actually to, to arm and support and finance organizations like Hezbollah, the Shiite militia in Iraq, the Shiite militia from Afghanistan who is acting now in Iraq in, uh, and in Syria. I don't see traces of uh, defense in their policy. Yes, over here, um, six or seven thirty. Yeah. Uh -huh. Hello, Benjamin Rudolph's Embassy of Switzerland. Mr. Snow, you talked quickly earlier about the volatility. Okay, I didn't hear. Uh, Embassy of Switzerland, Benjamin Rudolph. Of Switzerland. 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 Yes, you s briefly spoke about the volatility of the region earlier and the territories, uh, aside of obviously Gaza, and I was wondering. What is the worst case prediction to the security and defense establishment of Israel? What does this worst case scenario look like in the territories? What's the worst case 
if there were an eruption in the West, presumably you're talking about the West Bank, what is the worst case scenario? The worst case scenario is an ethnical armed conflict. This is the worst side, uh, the, the worst case scenario. The co that will be an armed collision between the settlers and the local Palestinian uh, population. It's a very, very bad scenario. Well, there's actually a worse case situation than that, yes. and that is the collapse of the institutions of self-governance that it's ena enable It includes, of course, the, 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 the evaporation of the PA, the, the, what will be with the armed units of their security forces that today are working with us together against terrorism. But the, 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 broader, uh, the broader aspect may be uh, et ethnic, ent ethnic conflict. Yes, second row. Uh, thank you, Dave Rubinowitz, I'm retired. Uh, the Palestinian refugees are actually refugees from a war between Israel and the Arab League, which started in 1948 and has never ended. It's an ongoing war. The actions of Hamas in uh, Gaza and Hezbollah in southern Lebanon and Syria are all fronts in that war. And the, Pal and the Palestinian refugees, and especially the ones not in the territories, the majority who are in camps in Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan, are pawns in this war. And wouldn't it make sense for the first priority to be to end this war so that Israel and the Arab League could work together to s resolve the refugee issues and confront Iran together? There is no, no Israel-Palestinian agreement without solution of the pr economic problem of the refugees. It is not through, by no way, the return, except maybe for symbolic numbers, to the state of Israel. The, the countries which host them should be not compensated, but there must be an effort to provide them with accommodation, proper accommodation, education for their next generation. It's a huge effort in which the Arab countries should take part, the wealthy Arab countries. And allow me to tell you another point, which people tend to forget. There, are se there were 700,000 refugees, even more, from Arab countries who fled to Israel. They lived in refugee camps in Israel. But the, the government of Israel, who had no resources, no resources, did the effort to give them, pr in a process of six, seven years, proper housing. Did, we, we didn't keep them in refugees, refugee camps forever. On the contrary. So uh, that's, a, that's the difference. And the burden, the burden of building a new future to their Palestinian refugees, part of it should be shouldered by the Arab states. Yes. Uh, Ralph Nuremberger, Georgetown. Um, I wonder how you react to the moves by the Trump administration in the last few months, uh, the closing of uh, the PLO office here, the moving of the embassy to Jerusalem, the declaring Jerusalem to be the capital, the ending of funding to the PA, the ending of funding to UNRWA, to the hospitals, uh, et cetera. Are these steps designed to try and promote a peace process? Will they be helpful in the long run? Neither of the measures that you mentioned was helpful for the cause of peace. And allow me to tell you briefly why. And I'm not taking part in any domestic politics here, but when it comes to, to the security of Israel, I have to react. I will start with Jerusalem. My father used to say that he knew the name of Jerusalem before he knew the name of his, of his native town, of his hometown. 
when I, the first song that my mother sang to me was about about Jerusalem. Why I'm saying it? We don't need we the, the Jews don't need approval from anyone that Jerusalem is the capital of the Jewish of the Jewish people. No matter when the no matter when the embassy is there. And I believe that the role of the U.S. president is to un is to unify the Arab world against Iran and not against America and Israel. One thing. Second, what good things? What is better that the Palestinians have representative representation in the Washington D.C. or they don't have? For the, for the sake of the American influence in the region. What is better? The budget of UNRWA. We are struggling to keep as possible the situation in the, in the refugee camps, mainly in Gaza, as I told you, to mitigate the suffering. If you take the teachers and you close the, the schools, it will be... The, 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 gover the, the population there will be more radicalized or less radicalized. Jordan, a very loyal ally of the United States, if they don't have budget for the schools in the refugees camps in Amman, in Jordan, it is good for Jordan, it strengthens Jordan, which is a bulwark of stability uh, in the region and a, and a, and a loyal ally of the United States. I'm very sorry. I can't praise these measures, but they are part of, um, of the political pact between the entourage of Mr. Netanyahu and the entourage of President Trump. It has nothing to do with our security. Very sorry. Very sorry. Um, let's see. In the back. Thank you. I'm Leon Weintraub, retired Foreign Service. You spoke about Jordan as a very strong ally of, of the United States. I'd like to ask you about the recent measure by Abdullah to uh, abrogate the agreement on these two small parcels of land. And what would be the reason behind that? And would that s suggest that d domestically he's w weaker than we think he is? Look, this is a very painful story. And why? In the, in the text of the Israeli-Jordanian peace agreement, there was one very interesting and positive precedent. There was there a distinction between sovereignty of, of a la on land and the use of land. And the agreement, the principle that was enshrined was that one of the parties, one of the countries have sovereignty, but they allow the other side to work there, mainly in agriculture. This was a very important precedent for other agreements in the future. Now, under domestic pressure, there are very strong, strong and vocal elements in Jordan who are against the peace with Israel that exert pressure on the government, on the king, to slash parts of the agreement. What you don't know is that messages about this imminent problem were sent by the Hashemite court to Jerusalem and were ignored months ago, long time ago. This is a very serious problem, and I don't see now how it is how it is resolved. Well, the deadline was a 25-year leasing agreement, which, October, ex October. which expires next week, and the Jordanians, under pressure, under pressure, mm -hmm. demonstrations as early as last September. I'm not sure that the Israelis were reading these signs correctly. I, I suspect there'll be a negotiation over the course of the next year to see what the king can extract 
And I'm not even sure what the Israelis paid for to the Jordanians. I think it was done in terms of water compensation in water for the leasing for uh, allowing Israeli farmers in the Jordan Valley and the Arava to farm these and for tourism purposes to farm these two relatively small parcels of land. But it's a negotiation. And I suspect it's negotiation. It may come out okay it's in the, the end. Look, it's the the agreement between Israel and Jordan is so important. It's so important. It's a pity to 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 spoil it for something which is actually minor and just to appease some anti normalization protester in Jordan. But for this you need that both sides will be creative and will come with intelligent goodwill to solve it. Every, every problem is, is, is resolvable. Right. But let's hope, it, it, let's it, hope it, so. Okay, we have time for a few, maybe two more questions. Yes, right here in the middle. Hi, I am Mutaya from the American University. Uh, my question relates to the future of the Jewish nation state. Um, the, the Arabs in Israel, and their numbers are increasing. So how does uh, Israel plan to deal with the Arabs in the state of Israel? What, are, what, does, what do the Israelis do about uh, Israel's national minority, roughly 20%? Israel's national minority, roughly 20% of Israeli citizens who are Palestinian citizens of Israel. There are 20% 20, 20 of the Israeli population are not Jewish. And they, they enjoy most of the rights, or all the rights, except the duty to serve in the military. That not all of them, but part of them are, are, are serving. Unfortunately, recently there was a legislation of a bill which called the Nation Bill, which erodes the status of the, of the Arabs and the Druze in Israel, it's a very negative measure, and uh, I hope that sooner than later this this law will be will be cancelled, because what happens on the ground is that more and more uh, members of this large minority are eager to be integrated in the Israeli society, and it succeeds. For instance. Most of the pharmacists in Israel are Arabs. In the medical sector, more than 20% of the doctors, of the nurses, are Arabs. So there is a growing participation of the Arab population in the economic life of Israel. The, basically, the process is positive, but such nationalistic uh, legislation spoils a very positive process where it harms us more. The Jews who serve in the military, as we do, but they are, by this law, they are considered as a, as a minority with, with less rights than the, than the Jews. It serves them shoulder to shoulder. We have to go back, we have to go back to the Israeli Charter of Independence from May 48. That David Ben-Gurion read it in the, when he declared the State of Israel. Full equality to all the minorities. That's what we should, to this text we should return. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, yes, over here, sir. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, we can do both. <laughs> if they're short questions. M my name is David Sobelson from Washington, D.C., uh, and I have a question about the exclusion of BDS supporters from Israel. Fortunately, look, BDS is a na is nasty organization. And it tries to harm all the Israelis, all the state of Israel. It's not because they oppose the policy of Israel. They oppose the existence of Israel. 
and they use nasty tactics and they deserve all the penalties which are enshrined in the Israeli law. But when there is an attempt to punish somebody that he is maybe or allegedly related to the PDS, to the, the BDS, then came the Israeli Supreme Court and say no. Only a week ago with the, this lady. Lara al Qasim, but she Lara the su Supreme Court yeah. ruled in her favor. So, so uh, we, fortunately, we refer to this organization in disproportion to the real danger. You understand what I say? Israel is strong enough to resist the BDS. You know, all the countries like our drip irrigation, our technology, our missiles, they like to buy it. And the BDS cannot, uh, cannot affect it. It doesn't mean that all these countries are in favor of our policy, but what they try to do to harm us economically, it, it, uh, it doesn't work. Why? Because we produce the best technologies in the world. And the world is eager to, to have our, our, te our technology and admire our, our achievements. I would only point out that um, we talked about this earlier, at a time when you have one of the most right-wing governments in Israel's history, when there is no serious pursuit of Israeli-Palestinian peace, um, the Prime Minister of Israel and the State of Israel enjoys the best relations that it's had in its history with all five members, permanent members of the Security Council and has more diplomatic <coughs> relations and connections. I think 160 countries out of 193 that sit in the UN for precisely the reason that you suggest. And it's one of the paradoxes or anomalies of the current situation. Israelis were told during the 90s peace would guarantee connectivity to the world. And a peace process would bring Israel into contact with so many more countries. And the reality is whether it's exhaustion or the importance of maintaining these connections, it's, to me, it's an extraordinary, stunning fact. There is a paradox here, and if you allow me, in my last mo moment here, sure. I, will, I will explain it. <laughs> the world, all the world, admire our technology, our culture, the vibrant and democratic character of Israel. That's why there is a growing tourism, investment, all, all comes from the productive part of the Israeli society, from those who invent, those who create. The sympathy of the world is to this part of Israel, not to the settlers who cut olive trees by night. Now, there is no overlapping between what you describe and the diplomatic reality when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This is the paradox here. Last week, Palest Palestine was elected to be the president of the G77. Right. What is the G77? It's the group of develop developing countries in the, in, in the UN, and they were elected. What was the ratio? Of, of, of the vote, three against Israel, United States, and Australia. F 146 voted for the Palestinians. This is the ratio, 146 to three. What does it mean? That when it comes to the decisive conflict for us and the real crucial diplomatic issue for Israel, 
the world is not with us. Now, it happens so because of other things, the issue of Israel-Palestine was, was uh, pushed to the, yes. co- to, the co- to the corner, was thrown to the corner. And that's why we still enjoy, as you say, the relations with the five members. Yes, but when it will, when, when it will come to a moment of decision, or, God forbid, to the worst-case scenario, they will not be will be us. More than that, I will tell you. I started our conversation by speaking about the two conflict, right? Two possible conflict. What what may happen? I'm worried about it. If we will have tomorrow to take a military action in Lebanon, the IDF will have objectives to do A, B, and C. Who will decide? Who will decide how long this war will take? Not us. The Security Council. A majority in the Security Council may may stop us at the moment that we paid all the sacrifices without reaching the military goals. Right. That's what happened last time in 06. I'm not entirely sure that it's going to happen. The, all you need is one veto to block a UN Security Council resolution. And I suspect you'll you'll have that. Not, not because Mrs. Haley is no more with us. No, I understand that. Not because of her absence. I am not sure that even this administration will be able will isolate itself only for our sake. But this is. Let's hope we don't face that situation. Okay. Please join me in thanking Ephraim for a terrific presentation. Thank you very much.